Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants Hangout. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I will be your host for today. And I'm really excited for today's event. Today, we're going on a virtual field trip. So we're joining Boise State University's Intermountain Bird Observatory to learn all about their raptor migration project. So scientists are in the field right now studying the migrating birds of prey uh, up close at the Lucky Peak Research Station. We're going to learn a little bit about the science that's happening uh, with Heidi Carlisle today. And if we're lucky, we're going to get to meet some of the raptors uh, if they're able to catch them as they're on their migration. And just a heads up to any of the classrooms joining us live or maybe on YouTube. Um, the camera is not perfect today. We might lose the camera a little bit, uh, but we're going to make it happen. So Heidi, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. I'm really excited to learn about your work. Yeah, thanks for having me. And sorry, our reception isn't so good today. Oh, there's a long delay on this too. Uh-oh, Joe, I saw your lips moving, but I did not hear what you said. Oh, sorry, I said, that's okay. Uh, oh. We lose you for about a minute or so, and then it seems to come back, so we're going to make it work. Cool. All right, well, so I guess you guys can't see me right this second, but we are sitting in a little blind, so a little box on top of a mountain, and that allows us to be kind of concealed and hidden. And our goal today is to catch some migrating raptors, so migrating birds of prey that are heading over us. Um, we're at a site called Lucky Peak, which is just outside of Boise, Idaho. And we're sitting up on a ridge that runs north-south. So birds this time of year, it's fall migration, they're heading south for the winter. And so we're watching as raptors are flying from the north. They sort of follow the mountain ridge and this funnel and then come here to us. So our goal today is to catch and tag as many raptors as we can. And it looks like... Here, here down below us, but it's yeah. not seeing anything yet. Okay, so there's a hawk. We might be able to get it into the station, so I might have to be quiet while we're doing this. Oh, it like, kind of turned, but didn't... Mm. No, it looks like it's keeping going. Oh. oh, it's ignoring us, so... You guys might have heard another voice in the background, so I'm the Education and Outreach Director for the Intermountain Bird Observatory, and then Jay is the one in the hot seat today. He's the one running all of our traps for our raptors and trying to catch some of these birds. So our goal is to get them to see us, and to do that we have some lure birds. So we have a little pigeon. It's wearing a little leather vest, like a bulletproof vest to protect it from the hawks. And that little pigeon flaps and hopefully gets the attention of some of the hawks. And so that's how we kind of lure those hawks in to catch them. So you can kind of compare it to like fly fishing where we send out a lure there just like when you're fishing. We hope the raptors notice it and then we hope they come in. And around each pigeon and lure bird we have a little trap. So we have a bow net that can flip over. So if the hawk comes and lands, it'll flip on top of the hawk and catch it. We also have nets that are stationary, so they're spread in a line surrounding that pigeon to hopefully catch that hawk as it's flying towards the pigeon. Um, and you guys might have heard, but if a hawk comes in, I'll have to... S oh, is vulture. that... Oh, vulture. We can't catch vultures because they like to eat dead things. They don't like to eat live birds, so... But every time we see a vulture, we get tricked. We hope that it's a bird of prey that we're able to catch. So I'm sorry you guys can't see us. Um, I should mention, so the reason we're doing this hawk trapping is to measure the hawks, identify their age, their gender, and then put a little metal tag on their leg. Oh, and maybe you guys can see me now. So let me see if I can show you guys these metal tags. So... We have these little bands. They fit like a watch or a bracelet on the bird's leg, and they each have a unique number that identifies just that hawk. So no other hawk in the world will have that same number. So our goal is to put these tags on these birds' legs, and then hopefully either we catch them again or somebody else catches them again. So we actually just had one of our hawks, a sharp-shinned hawk that we banded, um, 
it got re-caught south of us. So we captured it it on September 11th, right? And then this weekend, they re-caught it. So in just a few days, this hawk traveled all the way from Idaho um, down to near Salt Lake City. So let me show you guys the view while I have the chance, since I think you guys can see me. So here's our ridge and our view north. So we're watching north of us, hoping to see these raptors. Here's Jay. You can see he is pulling some strings. So that's what convinces our lure bird to flap. Hopefully you guys can see that. And so we're just hoping, you guys can see some of our nets and our lines there. We're just hoping that a raptor comes in and lets us band it. So the reason we're doing this research, um, this would be research that you would consider long-term monitoring. So we've been banding birds here at Lucky Peak for more than 20 years. And so this gives us a lot of good information about long-term how are birds doing. Are their populations going up? Are we seeing more birds than we used to? Or are their populations going down? And that lets us identify threats to birds. So if their populations are going down, that might mean that we need to do some more research and figure out the cause. So first, with long-term monitoring, that's our goal is to identify the problem, or I mean to detect that there's a problem. So detect that there are changes, and then we could do more focused research to then figure out exactly what that problem is. Harrier, but it's not seeing me. Another Harrier. Okay, let's hope we get it. That would be cool. So, so far, what we've seen in our long-term monitoring is some changes due to climate change. So, we've noticed that both our songbirds and our hawks are changing the timing of their migration. So, they're either coming later or earlier than they used to. And some species aren't changing at all. Ooh, here's this harrier. Come on, buddy, see it. Come on in, dude. All right, not so I'm not intrigued at all. Oh, not even hungry. Well, let's hope. Do you guys all have your fingers crossed there in your classrooms? Uh, yeah, please. Bring us good luck. There's a lot of you, so if you all cross your fingers, maybe we'll uh, catch a hawk for you. So Heidi, you mentioned a couple species. Can you talk about the the types of hawks you're hoping to catch? Yes, good idea. So um, we're mostly catching hawks called excipiters. So that's a group of hawks that are specialist bird eaters. So they really love eating birds. And so it kind of makes sense that in this area where we're also studying big numbers of songbirds, we have lots of these bird eating hawks hanging around with us too. Um, so there's two species that we mostly catch which are sharp-shinned hawks and cooper's hawks. And those are species that probably anywhere where you guys are viewing in your classroom, they probably live where you guys are. So they're a pretty widespread species, both of those across North America. Um, we also get lucky and catch some red-tailed hawks sometimes. And you've heard us mention northern harriers. So those are the marsh hawks or the harrier hawks that um, hunt rodents usually, so it's not too surprising that we're not catching them today. Um, we also catch a lot of American kestrels. Those are North America's smallest falcon. So they're really tiny, about the size of an American robin. Um, and they love eating sparrows and grasshoppers and mice and voles. Um, we also catch some of the larger falcons, so peregrine falcon which you guys have probably heard of because they're pretty cool. They're known as the fastest bird and I think the fastest animal ever. Um, they can dive at speeds more than 200 miles an hour. Um, and then we catch their cousin, the prairie falcon, which is a pretty similar sized bird um, that lives in Idaho. Ooh, and Jay is running, so maybe that he's means he saw a hawk or maybe he's just going fast. <laughs> All right, let's catch our view. So. We have these lure birds. Oh, yeah, I think Jay might see something. It's another harrier. I just figured I'd get in here as soon as I could. I saw That's another harrier. Oh, I see. Out there. So some of our birds today may be the reason why our reception is bad and also why we're seeing these birds flying past us and not stopping to eat is 
the wind direction. So wind direction really predicts how raptor migration is going to go. And reason for that is all of these birds of prey are trying to migrate and save as much energy as possible. And so a lot of times what you'll see raptors and vultures do this too, is they'll circle and circle and spiral without flapping their wings. And the way they do that is they're relying on air currents. So here at Lucky Peak, we have a lot of winds that and hit the mountain range and it causes a really strong updraft. So wind rising and giving them some nice lift along the edge of the ridge. So that allows them to ride those rising air currents and not have to flap at all. We also have this big valley behind us where the sun shines and really warms up the air and that causes rising hot air called thermals. So columns of hot air that are rising from ground level and heading up into the sky. And so the raptors will seek those out and once they find them, they'll spiral up and go up. So today, because of the way the wind is, a lot of these raptors are passing at a distance from us. They're not passing very close. And so that can make them more difficult to catch. All right, so on a good day, Heidi, how many raptors might you see? We might catch, I think yesterday they, yesterday they caught 40. Um, today, I'll guess we're gonna catch closer to 20. But we usually catch, you know, a couple an hour at least. So I think you guys will probably get the chance to see at least one raptor today. All right, and so Heidi, right now they're on their migration south. Do you set up to catch them again on their way back when they're heading north later uh, in the year? So some Hawk Watch stations do um, monitor spring migration. We actually don't hear for a couple of reasons. Um, our mountain range, and maybe, can you guys see me at the moment? Yep. I'm gonna try to show you guys. So our mountain range, if you look north of us, there's tons of mountains. And then if you look south of us, there's desert. And so we have a really strong fall migration because this nice funnel of mountains is north of us and it, it catches birds, they follow those mountains south and they get to us. In spring migration, there's no funnel of mountains. And so usually they may be using different mountain ranges or they might just be migrating through the valley in the spring. Um, and so we miss that spring migration here. Um, some stations have a ridge. Two birds. Ooh, two birds, okay. Hopefully we'll see one of these. So you might hear Jay whistling, so he's trying to get the attention of these birds to see if they'll come in closer to our station. Okay, one of them is on its way. Okay. So we might have a bird. I'm gonna let you guys get a view here. All right, so we've caught one hawk. There's another one in the area, so we're gonna hope to catch a second one for you guys. Well, that was a great view. We saw the hawk fly in. We saw it uh, get caught, so we're pretty excited. This is pretty awesome. Awesome, another one. I don't know if you guys can see that. It's circling. See it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Oh, you get one of them? Uh, yeah. Sure, I can try. Yeah. I don't know. Christina, yeah. do you want to help hold the phone? Yeah. All right, guys, we're going for a hawk. <laughs> this is so cool. All right, cool. Your phone and I'll watch you. Uh, sure, yeah, you got it. Uh -huh. All right. So I didn't introduce you guys to Christina, but uh, <laughs> she's one of our assistant banders today. 
And so this hawk looks very tangled, but we do a lot of practice and training to get these guys out of these nets safely. And this looks like a little tiny sharp shin mm -hmm. hawk. So a good first bird to catch. I like it. So with these guys, the key is to hold them safely so that their feet don't grab me. Because they have very sharp claws for killing the little songbirds that they like to eat. Their beaks are a little bit sharp, but those are sort of, the, sort of my least concern compared to those sharp talons. All right, buddy. So this is a, a young male sharp shinned hawk. And in hawks, males are smaller than females. So this is about mm. the tiniest guy that we catch. Can you oh, tilt the camera down yeah. just a little bit for us? You guys there able to see go. this little dude? There we go, yeah. So a tiny little sharp shinned hawk. You can see his teeny, teeny little legs. That's why they're called sharp shinned hawks. And we're going to take this guy back into the blind and put a little band on his leg. Yeah. All right, cool. Got one. All right, that's so cool. <laughs> Are we making you guys dizzy? <laughs> All right. So we have, let's see, how's the light? Pretty good. So, yeah. Jay, would you mind? Oh, do you want to stand on the other yeah, side? Yeah, I'll stand on that one. That works. All right. There. So here's our little sharp shin hawk again. I don't know if you guys can see us. Yep. So I'm going to put a, him in a little can so that he feels comfortable while we measure his little leg and make sure that we put the right size band. So this guy probably takes our smallest, yeah, our smallest band, a band size two. So we use this little gauge to measure his leg. So we'll get this little band. And we have these pliers, you guys can see they have two holes in them. So this allows us to close that band around the leg of this guy without even touching his leg. So it looks like I'm grabbing his leg with these pliers, but there's the perfect hole so that I'm not actually touching his leg. Do you want to try before? Yeah, sure, do you mind? <laughs> We're cramped in this blind. So Christina has to be the data recorder, the videographer, all sorts of okay. stuff. So go. here's this band. I opened it so it's in a little C shape so that I can slip it around his leg. What's the number? Um, and his number is, uh, starting at the beginning, 1192-08077. All right. Two? Yeah, size two. That's right. And he's a hatchier male. So this guy is brand new little hawk. Was just born this spring, somewhere north of us, maybe Alaska, maybe Canada. Um, he doesn't have a band on his leg yet, so nobody else has banded him. So we won't ever know exactly where he was born but we do know that he was born north of us. All right, so can you guys see his little claw? We've got that band on his leg, and the key is it can spin, and it can move up and down, so it's comfortable, just like if you guys were going to wear a watch or a bracelet around your wrist. Um, we want to make sure that since these guys are wearing this for the rest of their life, we want to make sure it's comfortable for them. So now I'm going to measure how long his tail is. And, oh, it looks like we just lost you guys. Hopefully uh, we'll get you back when we pull him back out of the can so you guys can admire his cute little face. That's okay. <laughs> it was coming through really clear up until a couple seconds ago. Uh, okay, let's hope he comes back. So I'll narrate what I'm doing. So I'm just measuring his tail right now. So we've got 138. 138. And we are measuring in millimeters. So we, as scientists, we always use the metric system. So instead of inches and feet, 
we use millimeters and centimeters. And then when we weigh this guy, we'll measure him in grams. So now I'm going to measure his wing. And a little bit there. We're back. All right. So measuring his wing, 177 for wing. So you guys can see I have this special ruler. Oh, oh. maybe I just lost you again. It has a little cap on the end of it, so I can push it up against the top of his wing and get make sure I get an accurate measurement. All right, and eye color is yellow. Mm -hmm. Crop is empty, so mm -hmm. we check and see if this guy has any food in his belly, and it looks like he has not eaten yet this morning. And I'm also checking this guy for parasites. Luckily for us, Bird parasites are very specially adapted to live on birds. And so there's not very many parasites that live on birds that can transfer to humans. But we are always checking, so spreading their wing and checking underneath their wing to see if they have any parasites. So we look for lice. There's also these little flies that suck their blood kind of like a mosquito would. So we're keeping an eye open for that. And this guy looks like he's healthy and he doesn't have any parasites, so that's a good sign for him. So, cute little guy. Figure I might as well show this guy off while yeah. we actually have the camera running. So, yeah. um, this guy is one of those exhibitors I was telling you about who likes to eat birds. Mm. Oh, we just lost you again. So, he has very short, rounded wings and a long tail. So, those short, round wings allow him to fly through really dense shrubs and forests. So he can duck and weave in between the trees and branches as he's chasing after the little songbirds that he wants to eat. And he also has an extremely long tail for his body size. And that tail acts as a rudder. So it allows him to steer and do really sharp zigzags chasing after the songbirds. Um, the songbirds are much smaller than him, so they're a lot more maneuverable. Oh yeah, here. So you can see his long, long tail with those stripes on it. And then this short little round wing. You can see the little fingers on his wings spread out. And so those are some of the adaptations that he has to be really good at chasing after little songbirds. Now this guy's young, I mentioned. So he has a yellow eye. When he's an adult, when he's um, a year old or more, he'll have a very kind of reddish orange eye. And he'll also molt his feathers. So right now he has a very brown back. And when he gets older, he's going to molt and have kind of a, a bluish gray kind of slate colored back. So he's really going to change his appearance. But for now, he has really good camouflage. So he's brown. He has this streaky brown chest. So as a young bird, he's nice and camouflaged. And that helps him survive when it's pretty tough to survive when you're a young bird. He's never migrated before. So he's just relying on instinct to move him south for the winter. And so it's kind of good that he has that advantage of um, being a little bit more camouflaged than a grown-up hawk. So he has a little bit of a handicap that helps him survive this time of year. So I'm going to weigh him while you guys are off camera. Um, let's see how much he weighs. Oh. Tear the container. Oh, it's a little tippy, huh? All right, here we go. See how much he weighs. So knowing how much he weighs, oh, we're back. So I'm weighing him in this little tube. Knowing how much he weighs can give us an idea of his his condition. So 100 grams exactly. Nice. Mm, nice. That's pretty healthy. Yeah. So pretty healthy, dude. That means he probably has some fat. So he's gained some energy for migration. That means he's eaten recently, probably also means that he has pretty good muscle. Um, and so this is some good research for us, getting good data on this guy, he was telling us that, that right? he's yeah. pretty healthy. Easy. So Got it. maybe this guy's ready to go, I think. Yes, he is. Um, maybe while we have the camera still going, yeah, we can release can this guy. Record you. Um, can I uh, radio yeah. hawk watch? Yeah. Do do I got to go this way or can I flip uh, the camera? Yeah, let's try it. <laughs> okay. So we're gonna sure set this guy loose. You. Yeah. Oh no, we just no, lost no. it again. Yeah, we'll have to wait. Okay, we'll take our time and see if it comes back. 
Um, so hopefully you guys will get to watch me give this little guy a toss in the air um, and send him on his way. So you'll notice we don't hold these birds very long. Um, we get as much data as we can to be really useful for our research, but then we want to get them out of here, get them back on migration, um, and yeah, get them flying south. So hopefully, oh man, I don't know if our reception is going to come back. So I'll tell you guys a little bit. So you heard me mention radioing Hawk Watch. So we have two people stationed on the top of the mountain that are watching for every migrating hawk that passes overhead. Oh, oh here we go. All right, Hawk Watch, are you ready for release? Our, oh, oh, we just no, lost no, no, you again. No, no. Okay. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, hey, sorry. Problems with the live stream. Give me a second. Oh. oh, can we tell? Where uh, it's not back yet. I'll give you a signal when it comes back. Okay, let me know. Okay. Looks like a beautiful day, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, let me know when it comes back, and we'll uh, give him, let this guy get out of here. It might just come back for just a second at a time. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys for being patient. So we're, oh, oh. we're back. Are we back? Yeah. Okay, I'll go watch him going. Woohoo! Right to my face. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Did you guys get to see that? Uh, were you guys able to see it? It stayed It stayed clean for us. You're still here, but you must have been fast. I don't think we saw it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. I wanted to get him out. <laughs> yeah, you guys got it. It was a young male. Oh, and there goes the camera. Oh, and Good it's timing. gone. <laughs> That's okay. It held out, and we got to see the process. That was so cool. Good, I'm glad. Well, if you're, if you're ready, we can start taking some questions from the classrooms. Yeah, give me, sounds like we have another hawk in the station, so give me like, okay. we might have to wait until we catch another one, but right, yeah, then we can take some going. questions. <laughs> Jay's working hard to get us another hawk. Looks like it was not that interested. All right, you guys jump in. Okay, we're going to run back into the blind. So right. Jay had a hawk come into the station, but wasn't able to catch it. No, it didn't even come in. I can't get their attention. Bummer. Well, good. Okay. I'm glad you guys brought us good luck. Yeah, okay, that's... so I think I can start taking questions if you guys are ready. All right, so we'll know if you go quiet that you're trying to catch another bird, but let's meet a class. <laughs> We've got Mrs. Rupp's class in uh, Jonesville, Virginia. They're grade five students. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing grade fives? <laughs> All right, we've got a question. Will the band hurt the bird? The bird as the Ooh, well Hurt the Will the band hurt the bird? No, that's a good question. So just like when you guys wear a watch or a bracelet, it's really smooth metal and it's very, very lightweight. So I think I forgot to mention, but these bands are made out of aluminum. So the really light, so the really lightweight metal that is in pop cans. So it's super, super light. And we always make sure that for a really tiny bird, of course, we have to put a tiny band so that it doesn't affect their flying. Um, but yeah, so it's a really smooth band, no sharp edges. So it'll be, it would just be like you guys wearing a watch or, you know, a lot of humans, we wear bands on our fingers, right? So just like wearing a metal ring on your finger. Um, yeah, so in all our research we do, we want to make sure that we have the bird's best interest in mind too. So we don't want to ever cause any extra stress or hurt the birds in any way. So we do a lot of training to make sure that doesn't happen. All right. Well, we've got Mrs. Akel's grade fives joining us in uh, San Antonio, Texas. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing, grade fives? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> what's, what's the best part about your job? In your... Ooh, the best part about my job? <laughs> well, <laughs> everything, I think, is a pretty cool job. Um, I get to study all different kinds of birds, and I think I'm pretty lucky in that way. 
Um, a lot of biologists are just specified on one group, but I get to study hawks. I get to study songbirds, hummingbirds even. Um, and so I get to see a lot of variety. And another part of my job I love is getting to talk to people about birds because as a scientist, I love collecting data and I love learning how I can improve the lives for birds um, and work for conservation. But if I don't have other people who care and want to help me save birds, then I'm not going to get anything done. So one of my favorite parts is stuff like this, getting to kind of show you guys what I do. All right. Well, I've got a quick question uh, coming in via YouTube from a class watching on YouTube. Uh, Mr. Awesome. Class, his class is in Canton, Michigan. And they're wondering, they see red-tailed hawks flying over their playground. What kind of food might they be looking for? Ah, so red-tailed hawks, they're a lot tiny guys just saw. And they mostly go after things um, like rodents, so small voles and mice, ground squirrels, rabbits. Um, so they have really strong, big talons for grabbing some of those bigger rodents. Um, so yeah, they're pretty big birds and they can eat some pretty big stuff. Snakes, yeah, snakes too. <laughs> All right, well let's meet our next classroom. We're gonna go to Stratford, Ontario, here in Canada. Mrs. Kern's awesome. class, they're grade four or five students. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing grade four or fives? Hey guys. Join us. How much do they eat in a day? Can you give them right up here? Right up here. How much do they eat in a day? Ooh, how much do they eat in a day? That probably depends on the hawk. So I know some raptors, like barn owls, they can eat about 16 mice or more in one night. That's probably pretty close to the record. That's a lot of food. Um, a red-tailed hawk that's that gets a little cottontail rabbit, that might be all they need for the day because that's a pretty big piece of food. Um, our little American kestrels, they eat a lot of grasshoppers, so they have to eat a lot of grasshoppers to fill their bellies for the day. So it depends on the hawk, and it depends. So during migration, some hawks eat a lot, and they get a lot of fat, and they get ready to go. Other hawks, we think that they don't actually eat very much on migration, so they might actually kind of go hungry and just fly, fly, fly until they get south to where they're headed for the winter time. But that's something we're still studying, so you guys might have heard me um, talk about whether it had a full or empty crop. So we record whether a bird has recently eaten. We can see a little lump in their throat if they ate recently. And so that gives us kind of an idea about whether these hawks are eating during migration or whether they're um, hungry at the time. All right, let's meet our next classroom. This time we're going to third graders in Mount Airy, North Carolina. Uh, Mrs. Mm. Patton's class, let me turn their microphone on. Cool. How we doing, North Carolina? <laughs> awesome. Nice and loud. Ooh. I can't really hear you guys. Can, are you able to get closer to your microphone? How old can they get? Oh, how old can they get? That's a good question. So some raptors can live a very, very long time. Um, there's records of birds living 50 years or more. So here in Idaho at the World Center for Birds of Prey, there's a couple of captive birds um, that are almost 60 years old. Um, Regularly in the wild, there's records of red-tailed hawks and bald eagles living 30 or 40 years. So they can definitely live a long time. The key for them is surviving that first year. So when they're little, like that little sharp-shinned hawk we caught, they're young, they don't know what they're doing, they have to figure out how to find food, how to migrate, how to not get eaten by a bigger hawk. And so, oh, maybe we have a hawk. Let's see if we can catch it. These birds are completely ignoring me. They're like not hungry today, huh? They're not hungry at all. Is this guy? Oh yeah, he's heading away, huh? The kestrel, yeah. It turned, had a half a look. And then oh. So we hungry. just had an American kestrel fly by. Maybe his belly full of grasshoppers, so wasn't hungry. Um, oh, but as I was saying, so uh, once they survive their first year, then they're pretty likely to live 
a pretty long time, at least 10 years. Uh, but that first year is kind of tough. So it's all about learning to survive through that first before uh, they kind of get their lives figured out. All right. And then our final last classroom, uh, Mrs. Gatowski's grade four or fives are joining us in Campbell. So when I turn your microphone on, let me know where that is in the US. Where's Campbell? And then we'd love to take one of your questions. So microphone's on. How's everyone doing? Great. So where's Campbell? Um, it's in, so it's in California, um, in San Jose. Perfect. California. Cool. So some of our red-tailed hawks might be My heading down south to you guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so who's got a question? Here we go. Okay, I have a question. Um, how do you normally wait before you catch a bird? Oh, it just went after some songbirds. Oh, we have a hawk that we might catch. Sorry. Come on, buddy. So, usually we wait. If it's really slow, we might wait an hour to catch the bird. If it's really busy, we might catch a bird every five minutes. Oh, it turns so you guys can see. This guy's got a full crop, so it mm. probably isn't as hungry as that we want it to be. So this hawk has a full, full belly. Recently ate, so I'm not sure if we'll catch it, but we're gonna try. No, it's just not no. even interesting. Dang. Okay, sorry, we have to keep pausing. Um, so yeah, so with our hawk trapping, it just depends. Sometimes every five minutes, sometimes one an hour. Um, one time Jay and I spent all day and we only caught three hawks and that was a long wait, but at least we have good scenery, so it's worth it anyways. <laughs> well, absolutely, and I think part of the fun of this, this hangout so far has just been waiting and, and anticipating, and I'm so glad that we caught the hawk. We got to see Me too. Before. That was pretty awesome. Good, yeah, I'm glad you guys got to see it and I'm glad the video worked so you guys could see that little guy. Yeah, well, uh, we have a few more minutes so why don't we take a couple more questions uh, from the classrooms. So give yeah. me a wave if I should come back to your classroom if you guys have another question. <laughs> right, lots, oh, of, lots of questions. <laughs> Let's start in Texas, Mrs. Awesome. Aiko class, your microphone's on. Uh, what's your favorite type of bird that you've caught? Ooh, that's our favorite question because it's so hard to pick. Um, man, Jay, what's your favorite that we... Deer Falcon. Deer Falcon. Mm. So the day I was telling you guys about how Jay and I only caught three birds all day, one of them was a Deer Falcon. So you guys will have to Google that. It's a really big falcon that lives up north in the Arctic, and they're pretty beautiful. So. And it's the only one we've ever seen. And it's here. the only one ever caught at IBO in 20 or years or even seen. Years, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I really like when we catch merlins. So they're a very tiny falcon and they're very fierce. So they're pretty fun. Very cool. I see someone at Mrs. Gatowski's camera. Your microphone is on. How uh, many birds think you catch a year? In a year? It depends on the project. So our hummingbird project, we banned between four and 500 hummingbirds a year. We banned between five and 7,000 songbirds in a year. And we banned how many hawks a year, Jay? 1,400. 1,400-ish yeah. at our hawk trapping station. So kind of a lot. And about four to 800 owls a year, depending on the year. So wow. we do a bunch of research. So what's your most active time of the season? Is it now or are there different seasons throughout the year? This is definitely our most active, especially for hawks right now. Um, it's kind of peak migration. So yesterday they counted more than 700 hawks flying over. We didn't catch all 700, but they counted <laughs> 700. Um, and so for the next week or so, this is our, our peak migration for hawks. Songbirds, it was really busy. Now it's kind of slowing down, but we expect that as some of our birds from Canada come through, 
uh, we'll get a big push in numbers again later in the season, closer to October. All right. And let's see, maybe we can visit one more class before we let you guys get back to business. So let's go to Mrs. Patton's class. Just come nice and close to the microphone for us. Okay, we'll do Rosalie. Um, do eagle, eagles have to wear the rubber fan, band thingy like the hawk? Do the, do the eagles have to wear metal bands like the hawks? Is that what your question is? Yep. Yeah, so if we catch an eagle, which doesn't happen very often, uh, we have really big bands. Let's see if you guys can see me right now. So this is the band for an eagle. So much, much bigger than the band we put on that little sharp shinned hawk. You can see it's bigger than my finger. Um, we catch maybe one eagle a year, and I've missed every single eagle. So Jay has caught one without me. I was pretty jealous. Um, but I haven't gotten to see one. All right. Well, I think we have time. So let's jump to Mrs. Rupp's class and see in Virginia if they have one more question. Come on. He's coming. That's okay. <laughs> right here. Do you, do you ever have to um, rescue birds? Do we ever have to rescue birds? Um, not in our work, but we do um, work with some people who do raptor rehabilitation. So that's a really important job too. So if a bird gets hit by a car um, or injured in some way, then rehabbers can help rescue them. But since we're up here during migration, there's no cars around here. There's no windows for birds to run into. We're pretty lucky that there's not a lot of dangerous things for our birds to encounter. So we're studying kind of the healthy birds that are passing by um, flying down the ridge. All right, Mrs. Hearn Smith will give you the last question. How do you tell if it's a male or a female? Oh, very good question. So one way is by size. So in the sharp shinned hawk, and then also the Cooper's hawks, they're very, very different in size. And in hawks and eagles, the girls are actually bigger than the boys. So that little sharp shinned hawk you guys saw, I knew right away that he was a boy because he was super, super, super tiny. Um, for some of the other birds, it's a little bit harder to tell. Um, Red-tailed hawks are pretty close in size, and so sometimes we just have to say unknown. Um, and then American kestrels, they're really cool. If you guys haven't seen them before, uh, you can look up some pictures, but the males and females are different colors. So the girls have these beautiful tiger stripe pattern on their back, and the boys have kind of a blue and orange pattern on their back. So they're very different. All so right. it depends on the species. Cool. Well, Heidi, thank you so much. That was that was a lot of fun. That was great. I'm, I'm glad the camera cooperated to give us some good views. We pretty much got to see the catch, uh, the whole process right up to the release. So that was that was awesome. Good, I'm glad it worked. I'm glad you guys got to see that hawk flying through the station. That was pretty cool. So tomorrow at 10 o'clock Eastern, we'll be joining you with some different classrooms on camera. And this time we'll be checking out the songbirds. So awesome. cross that we got some songbirds and uh, the camera cooperates a little bit more for us. <laughs> I hope so too. We'll see how it goes. All right. Well, a huge thank you uh, to you and to your team. You guys are doing some awesome work. So thank you so much. There they are. We're going to turn. We go. We're going to turn the microphones on in the classrooms, and you guys have to be really loud so the whole team can hear you in the blind. So goodbye and thank you as loud as you can. Let's go, boys and girls. Microphone coming on. <laughs> All right, thank you. So awesome. Thank you, Heidi. That was awesome. We'll see Thanks, you again guys. tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Thank you.